Uh, hi everyone, I'm Michele. Welcome to my talk, ProTRR or Principal yet Optimal in DRAM Target Troll Refresh. So at this point, I hope you understand that RAM affects everything. However, let's repeat it once again. So it affects your smartphone, your laptop, it affects servers, and it can compromise uh, your browser as well as uh, local or, or remote scenarios. So why should you care if this is not enough? Well, since its discovery, many, many exploits have been published, right? And we did with DDR4 vendors said that the problem was fixed, that they fixed Rammer and it was not a vulnerability anymore. However, in 2020 with Trespass, we saw that indeed there is an in-DRAM Rammer mitigation deployed in chips. However, uh, DRAM devices are still vulnerable. And as my colleague Patrick just showed you with Blacksmith, Actually, it turns out all devices are still vulnerable to RAMR. So what is exactly RAMR? Well, it's a vulnerability that affects DRAM memories, and this is due to the constant leak of the charge from the internal capacitors. And this effect can be accelerated by repeatedly activating rows that are adjacent from a victim row. So for example, let's assume there is a sentence like computer are secure, which is saved along a row that is usually referred as the victim row. If the adjacent rows, known as aggressors, are repeatedly activated, this will eventually induce the value stored to be changed, which is referred to as a bit flip, leading a sentence as computer are secure actually becoming a question. So just to give you an idea of how many activations are required, well, in the worst case scenario, we we're talking about 5,000 activation to induce a bit flip, so very, very few. Uh, how do mitigation work? Well, first of all, DDR is a synchronous protocol, which means that there is a stream of commands that is sent to a device, and the device has to respect it. And the commands we are interested in is, of course, raw activation and the refresh. Now, the refresh is a periodic command that is necessary for the device to work correctly. So. As activation comes, the raw address is used by the mitigation somehow, and then eventually, during this refresh operation, the mitigation will do additional work, refreshing rows that it considers to be victims or under an attack. And this is called target raw refresh, and this is repeated over time. How do mitigation work internally with a bit more details? Well, of course, variation apply depending on vendors, but generally, when there is an activation, the address of the row is used to update somehow some counters that are internally stored. And then eventually, when there is time to perform this TRR event, a victim selector chooses which row are considered to be under attack. So let's consider for a second TRR ideal, which is the perfect mitigation. So we are considering infinite storage and possibility to count every single activation. Well, with our work, we showed our novel attack called fainting, proving that even such mitigation would still be vulnerable to fainting. What do we mean by vulnerable? We mean that a victim row will never be refreshed by TRR. In other words, this gives us bounds for any attack to TR ideal, because we proved fainting to be optimal. And it also gives bounds for any deterministic mitigation, because of course, that will be worse than TRR ideal and in the paper we proved this. So this means that by fainting, we can understand the degree of protection that a device can have. How does it work, fainting? First, the key concept is that TRRs can only happen periodically. And in the stream of commands that are sent to the DRAM, we want to activate aggressors that actually generate decoy victim rows that will be refreshed instead of the real victim. So in this case, I color coded the row address. So as you can see, different rows activation will somehow pollute the memory of the mitigation, but then eventually we will also activate the real aggressor that is linked to the real victim in such a way that when finally there is time for these extra refreshes, the row that the mitigation chooses to refresh are actually decoys in place of the real victim. And this can be repeated indefinitely. So what forms the optimal attack? Well, we need to understand the number of decoys, the pattern for each decoy, and the duration of the attack. 
I will not get into details, but I can tell you that the concept is to minimize the activation used uh, to decoys while at the same time always saving the victim. And we proved everything. So let's have a visualization of fainting. In this case, an example with 36 decoys, which means 18 aggressors. So at the beginning of fainting, uh, all the um, aggressor linked with these decoys are activated. But as these decoys are refreshed, the aggressor are not activated anymore. Up to the end of fainting, where only the aggressor linked to the real victim is still activated. And by the way, we use this pattern in uh, real devices obtaining bit flips. So how exactly do we protect against fainting? Well, luckily DDR expects every row to be refreshed at least once in a TRF window. And this again happens with this refresh command. And this bounds the duration of fainting. In other words, starting from a certain rummer threshold, the X we know that the maximum amount of time that the row can be uh, hammered is X minus one, of course. And fainting gives us the idea if this device can be protected at all or not. However, there is a problem. We are still assuming infinite amount of space, right? So we need to introduce the first real world problem, which is limited storage. And how did we solve this? Well, let's introduce ProTRR design. As you can see, it's very similar to the design I showed you before, but there's a fundamental key aspect of difference, which is how we save and store values. Well, first of all, we store victim rows, and we use our novel data structure called proactive miseries, which is functionally based on miseries, but we introduce a novel way to uh, size it depending on this proactive environment. And furthermore, we also introduce the possibility to prune entries, meaning putting their value to zero once they are refreshed, of course. So does ProTR protect against fainting? Well, let's recap for a second. With TRR ideal, infinite amount of counters, fainting gives us this high fixed protection, which is the maximum that the device could support. And in the paper, we showed and proved that using a subset, a limited amount of counters, CMAX, will result in the same amount of protection. So of course this is good, but we're still missing something. We would like a tunable protection. We would like to use fewer counters for devices that are less vulnerable. So the question is, what does it happen if we lower the number of uh, counters? So let's introduce the second challenge of the real world, which is different raw armor threshold for different devices. So in the paper, we showed and proved that lowering the number of counters is possible, and fainting adapts in what we call fainting ghost, basically becoming more effective against a lower number of counters, which is exactly what we want, right? We want a tunable protection. And of course, we proved this. So what exactly is fainting ghost? Well, the concept is that rows can appear as already attacked. And before we get into that, let's briefly review uh, how miseries and proactive miseries works. Well, we have a fixed number of entries in our table plus what is called a spillover. And whenever we want to insert uh, an element into this table, of course, if there is space, we will go directly in. If the storage is completely filled, in case there is a match, you will just increase the counter. If there is no match, then the spillover will enter in play and it will be checked. So if the spillover is lower than the minimum of the minimum of the table, then the spillover will increase. If it's not, meaning that it's equal, then the entry will just replace the minimum in the table. So let's consider fainting, which is using a number of decoys larger than the entries in the table. Well, this is the pattern I showed you before, and in this case, in order for the victim to be saved, meaning that the, it's not picked for refresh, in this case, the attacker was activating three times the green, the green aggressor. Well, suppose a situation where the storage is completely filled with victims, and we want, as attacker, to obtain the same situation. So we activate the green aggressor and then it's checked against the spillover because the storage is filled. And the spillover is equal to the minimum. So the victim linked to the green aggressor just replaced the entries, plus one, of course, as if they had been already hammered this amount of times. And this leaves more time for the attacker to activate other 
uh, aggressors and even perhaps the real aggressor. Overall, it means that we need fewer activations to save the victim. So let's go on with uh, another challenge of the real world, which is limited power. Well, we will not get too much into details, but the concept is that TRR can be performed every TRR period refreshes, meaning that maybe it can be, um, TRR can be um, done every two or three refreshes or every 10 and so on. So how can we protect against fainting goals? Well, concept is literally the same. However, this time through fainting goals, we can understand the setup of pro-TRR in terms of TRR event period and in terms of counters needed. And this is one way of seeing it. The other way of seeing it is given the device resources such as power constraints or area constraints, we can understand what uh, the device can be protected against. And uh, how does ProTR solve the challenges of the real world, just as a recap? Well, for the storage, we showed and proved the optimal number of counters to protect against fainting and protect against fainting ghosts. For power, we showed the optimal number of TRR events and we also showed and described how variating this affects the threshold of the device, obtaining this way the optimal requirements for a given threshold of a given device. So for the evaluation, for the performance overhead, we used Gen5 full system simulation uh, benchmarking spec 2017. Gen5 is a cycle accurate simulator, while for the area and the latency evaluation, we implemented a NASIC device in 12 nanometers. So let's look at uh, flexibility of ProTRR. So as you can see, depending on the number of counters, there is a very broad range of supported uh, raw number threshold, but this is not all. We can also variate, as I introduced before, the TRR period, and I will show you between one and 15. And as you can see, we get a broad range of possibilities. And to give you a better understanding, we can look it with overlapped real uh, threshold from real devices. In other words, given, for example, a certain amount of counters uh, that the manufacturers wants to use for TRR, depending on the technology that is using and the power, it can decide to set up pro-TRR accordingly. Now, of course, this TRR induce um, energy overhead and we evaluated it. This depends on the TRR period, clearly, and I will show you from one to 15. And this is for a TRF window of 64 milliseconds, which is the default value of the DR4, but we also repeated it for a TRF window of 32 milliseconds. And this is because if ProTRR is deployed with a TRF window of 32 milliseconds, it, just, it can achieve a higher degree of security. But overall, the TRR energy overhead is always under 0.6%. So to conclude, we showed fainting as the first framework for security analysis of Indira mitigations. We showed the first formally proven Indira mitigation. And we showed optimality for counters and performance overhead. But is this actually everything? So actually, we did all of this for TDR5.2. And due to the limited amount of time, we cannot get into details, but I can just tell you that DDR5 adds a new command called RFM, which um, gives the device more time to perform these extra refreshes operations. So of course, we benchmarked SPEC 2017, analyzing the amount of extra uh, RFM commands that are being sent. And clearly, we also evaluated the, the energy overhead that depends on the RFM period. For more details about the um, evaluation, such as performance, you can read the paper. So to actually conclude, we also showed and proved the first mitigation compatible with uh, DDR5 standards. So uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to take any question. Thank you, Michele. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Go ahead. Hello, uh, glad to see a uh, mitigation in this session. So um, I think one of the issues with uh, Mishra Greece, at least in uh, SRAM was that it requires a CAM or like a fully associative yeah. search. So how does that scale when you need to uh, search for uh, search 1,000 counters in DRAM? Thank you very much, a very good question. So indeed we did not use uh, Mishra Greece, we use a proactive Mishra Greece, but however, 
the way we save uh, uh, the data is through normal register, so we do not uh, use CAM in our ASIC design exactly because of this reason. Uh, okay, so, so do you like uh, search uh, like one by one through the register? It, it's not one by one, it's a non-combinatory non uh, cascade. Okay. So it's just done in one cycle. And depending on the amount of uh, highest row that you need, then of course you will need maybe three cycles or four cycles. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks. Hi, um, thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm Inga Kang from University of Michigan. Uh, like for the last debate, I mean, first mi uh, mitigation compared with, with DDR5 standard, I think there was a paper in H HPCA this year uh, about called Midrail with th that interacts with RFM. I so uh, for what I remember about uh, Midrail, it got uh, uploaded on um, online, but before it got actually accepted uh, by any publication. So at the moment when we submitted this and it was accepted, uh, it was the first uh, DDR5 compatible, at least with RFM. So it's true that Mitril got uploaded online, but not through a peer-reviewed process. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, thank you. You're very welcome. I have a question too. So I'm curious, in your evaluation, did you ever see Pro-TRR activate when it didn't need to? So for example, there was no row hammer attack going on, but Pro-TRR still activated just because of some benign applications. Thank you very much for your question. So uh, our evaluation did not assume uh, an attack going on, and this is exact exactly because we want to understand the overhead of normal application rather than uh, a system under attack. So the overhead, uh, um, comes from uh, normal workload, but in terms of uh, IPC, uh, it's negligible. And I'm curious, what was the workload that triggered Pro-TRR in the benign workload? That oh, well, uh, the SPEC 2017 benchmarks. So the way, um, there, so we need to distinguish, right? There is DDR4 and DDR5. In DDR4, uh, the refresh mechanism needs to happen every single refresh and it's concurrent to the normal operation, so it's not a performance overhead. While with DDR5, depending on the number of activations that are being sent, there is this new command called RFM that needs to be sent if uh, RFM is active, right? So the um, frequency by which it's sent can be tunable. The lowest is 32 activations, for example, but 32 activation is actually quite low number. So uh, normal, um, uh, normal application coming from the benchmark simply triggers the send of, uh, of this extra command. However, our evaluation also showed that, that uh, the current values that the JEDEX standard uh, supports, which is from 32 to 80 as the RFM period, they're uh, an overkill. Let's say that we could do uh, a good protection which ma which, with much less. However, just to conclude the, the reply, this performance uh, uh, does not come from uh, ProTRR, um, the overhead, sorry. It comes from the JDEX standard. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. OK, let's uh, thank again all the presenters of this session. This is the end of section 4A. So yeah, this is the end. Thanks all for coming.